But again, just to backtrack and look at a few things, but something that's interesting to me is I started looking through the New Testament, just going back in my mind. So I just started, decided to make some references to the household. It's very fascinating to me how much the household is involved in the life of Christianity and the church. And it's very important when it comes to the building up and the stability of the church. It's interesting if you go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 46, Luke records the fact that they were breaking bread, and this took place in the church of Jerusalem, and they did this from house to house, and they would gather together, they would have worship together, they would break bread together. And this is just something that they did on a regular basis, and they gathered together with gladness and sincerity of heart. It's interesting that when you look at the Hellenistic cities and the spread of the gospel and the planting of churches, how crucial the household was. Very fascinating to me. The household of Cornelius, Caesarea, Acts chapter 10, verse 7 and 24. The household of Lydia and the jailer in Philippi. And all of these references have to do with not just the parents, the entire household. Everyone was there to hear the gospel, receive the gospel, respond to the gospel. You have the household of Stephanus, which is in Achaia, 1 Corinthians 16, 15. And then we have the households of Crispus and Gaius. Very amazing that when you look at the spread of the gospel, how poignant it was and how crucial it was that the household was involved in this process. Other households that are mentioned, Aquila and Prisca, and I, I love this, Aquila and Priscilla, wherever they went, they planted a church. They were church planters, and they did it in their home. Whether they were driven out and they moved out of their, their native city into a foreign land, wherever they went, they planted churches at Ephesus, Rome. This is what they were known for. You have Onesiphorus, his family is mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. And we have Philemon at Colossae. A church gathered together in his household. Nympha, Laodicea, and the church that gathered in her household. All these references we have, churches that gathered within these homes. Over and over, we see how crucial the household is in regards to the church and in regards to the gospel ministry. Jerusalem, the household churches were instructed as units in Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And it's interesting because this was Paul's typical custom. He, would, he made reference to the Ephesian elders that he went from house to house giving instruction. That is where they gathered. That is how they fellowshiped together. It was in these home churches, if you will. I remind you, though, also, Paul in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, there was also the lecture hall of Tyrannus where he taught for two years. We have the instruction given to the family units. We look at 1 Peter, you look at Colossians, you look at Ephesians. How crucial is the household in relation to the church? It's very crucial. When you look at the issue of the church itself, it's referred to as the household of God. And the one who is to care for it is to care for it as one who is a steward of someone else's household. And it's very interesting that even we have the word translated dispensation or konomion. It is, if you will, the house law is what it is. And it talks about God's plan of salvation. And those who were to care for it and to minister to it were those who were referred to as stewards or konomion. It's interesting because you look at the issue of being adopted, this also bears out the reality of the fact that we are family. Somehow I think we forget this of the church. We are family. We are the family of God. We don't always act like it, but that's the reality of our relationship. The household was the training ground for Christian leadership. Look at Titus. Look at 1 Timothy. The very first requirements, if you were looking for appointing men or releasing men and affirming men to the role of elder in the church, it was to look at their households, their relationship to their wife, then to their children, then their to, com their, to their communities. The household is crucial. Family life is crucial. But as crucial as family life and household is, it's interesting that when we came to this passage in Ephesians chapter 5, it's interesting because we're talking last Sunday. There really, as Robert was mentioning, we're talking about the fact that there's just really no examples given as saying this is the perfect marriage or this is the godly marriage to emulate, whatever. And the pattern that Paul finds 
that he gives for us as Christ and his relationship to the church. It one shows just how important marriage relationship is and household is, but it also shows just how important Christ and his relationship to the church is in our lives and how it should permeate our lives and it establishes the pattern for how we are to live our lives. It really gives God's design for what the family ought to look like. So this morning I want to talk about the issue of a God-designed and Godly-driven household. And, and all of these principles, and we're going to walk back to chapter 4, verse 1, and I have to say I, <clears throat> my father has greatly enriched my life over the years, and, and this morning is also a result of his enriching my life over the last week. His meditations on the passage and the last week's message and then coming together and sharing these things with me. So... I want to take you back, and we'll just walk back through these passages together, but Paul joins us, really, he challenges us in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And we've started to look at what this worthy walk looks like. Walk in unity, walk in non-worldliness, walk in love, walk in light, walk in care. But then all of a sudden, Paul then brings us really to a very concrete relationship, the relationship of the home, and this is really where it gets down to earth, if you will, in one sense. Because he really has taken us from the heavenlies, but now he brings us in chapter 5, verses 40, 22 and following, he brings us now into the homelies as to how we are to live in the home life. So he brings us into these very tangible, everyday relationships. And this is where it really needs to be worked out. This is where our Christian life really needs to be worked out. It's within the context of our household and our home. Not just in the world around us, not just in the body of Christ, but also within our homes. And we looked at the fact last week, <clears throat> this movement into this dimension, the visible dimension, in chapter 6, verses 10 and following, he is going to deal with the invisible dimension of life, the demonic dimension, and our response to the attacks of Satan and so on. But he brings us into this visible dimension and three things that I just we would look at in regards to this. But the first is to remind you the fact that when you look at these relationships, there's one common denominator. It is the husband. It is the father. It is the master. He is the common denominator between all of these sections as Paul gives instruction to the home life. But he starts with the husband and wife first because that is what is crucial in regards to the home relationship. They are the linchpin, if you will. I was talking about this on, on Friday with, <clears throat> with Ed and Brandon, but you know, I was thinking back to when we first had Ian. And it was interesting because I had to go away. We were in Russia at the time, and I had to go away and do ministry, and I was gone for a couple days, and I came back, and I noticed that, that his personality and his relation to Les had changed. <clears throat> and I realized it was because I wasn't around. And he didn't have that interaction of mom and dad in front of him and to see us together. And really, the reality is, is that we as husbands and wives, we provide stability for our children and for our households. And they look to us. I mean, it's amazing how many times they look to us. Even when they fall and get hurt, they look to us to see what our response is, to see how we're going to respond to that, and then they feed off of that. If somehow something isn't right between mom and dad, then all of a sudden things aren't right in their world. And so therefore Paul is going to address the husband and wife first. This is the primary relationship that really establishes everything within the home. But everything we talked about last week, everything filters down into the home life. Whether it's unity, whether it's non-worldliness, whether it's love, whether it's walking in light, or whether it's walking cautiously or in care. All of these things are to filter down into the home life. We are to be walking worthy walks within the context of the family. I mean, really, this is uh, the best place to test and gauge our life, right? Our spiritual life. Because when you think about it, when we go out from our home into the world, we can put on the act. We can put on the facades. We can pretend that everything is okay. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who says that everything is okay when you ask them is lying to you. But my point is this. When we move outside the context of the home, it's easy to put on a show. But when we come back home, that's where we relax. That's where we tend to really be ourselves. And that's really the testing ground to figure out if whether or not there's real transformation happening in your life or not. It's in the context of the home. 
Because see, they see you as you truly are. So when we talk about a worthy walk, everything filters down into the home life. Everything filters down into this relationship between husband and wife. And their lives need to be marked by this. Our life needs to be marked by this. All of these principles that we've looked at, starting in chapter 4, verse 1, apply to so many dimensions of life. But I want to show you how they also apply to the family and to the home. And we'll take the first one, walk in unity. So if you go back to chapter 1, chapter 4 with me, verse 1 and following. Talk about the issue of unity, and there's no doubt that's what Paul calls for here <clears throat> as God's spokesman in chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, and he first challenges it to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And I want to look at the flow of this, if you would, please, because there's fascinating stuff that Paul lays out here, <clears throat> but I don't want us to miss some crucial elements here. The first thing is the command is given. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, I just remind you, make note of verse 4 in italics, there is in the NASB, because there is isn't there in the original text. Paul immediately moves from verse 3 into verse 4 and immediately breaks out in verse 4, one body, one spirit, just as you would call the one hope of your calling. We'll come back to that thought in a moment, but he breaks off from what he's talking about in verses 1 through 3. But there is no doubt within this first three verses of chapter 4 where God's focus is as he speaks to the Apostle Paul. It is a God-defined focus. The issue is unity. No doubt about it. Some things that stand out for us as we looked at this before, but I just remind you, first is in the, in the term one. Now, it's interesting because unity isn't just addressed in chapter 4. We come to the idea of it in chapter 2, verse 14 and 2, 15, when he talks about the both being made one or the one new man. He even alluded to it, if you will. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, when he referenced to the fact that with a view to administration suitable to the fullness of times, Ephesians 1, 10, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth. This has a view to the issue of unification, this bringing or summing up of all things in Christ at the end of God's plan. But I want to take you back to chapter 4 because I want you to see that this definitely is the stress that Paul has in regards to this particular passage. It is on oneness. It's on unity. Notice this, if you would. Notice how many times we have the word one that runs all the way through chapter four. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Each one of us, each individual, one part, each one of you, 533. And it's interesting because in 533, notice with me, he's talking to husbands. Nevertheless, let each one of you, and really if I could translate it from the Greek as you, one by one, loving his own wife even as himself. And even that statement there in the reflexive pronoun, it's reflecting on the unity that exists, going back to verse 31, that they have become one flesh. So there's no doubt when we come to chapter 4 that there is a focus on oneness, there is a focus on unity. That is God's defined focus, if you will. Something else that, that is interesting about this particular passage in chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, is the term unity. Hinates. We saw this before, but this term is only used two times in all of the New Testament, and it's used here in this passage. There is no doubt where God's focus is when it comes to chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. It's on unity. Not only that, but when you walk through this passage of the one and others, notice with me how many times we have one another to show this oneness, this intimate relationship that we are to have. In chapter 4, verse 2, with all humility, with gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Chapter 4, verse 25, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We belong to each other because we belong to the body of Christ. 
When you think about the human body and its composition, this arm, this leg, these eyes, these ears, they all belong to one another. They belong to the one body. That is the way that the church is as well. We all belong to one another. So stop lying to each other and start speaking the truth. What a great motivation that we have. Notice with me in verse 32, the first part. Be kind unto one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Now what's interesting about verse 32 is the transition. The first part of verse 32 is alleluus. This is a reciprocal pronoun. What's interesting is that when he gets to the second part of verse 32, forgiving each other, he uses a different term. Ha'autoi. Now, this is an interesting transition because if you look in classical Greek literature, this ha'autois can also be, which is reflexive, it can be used similar to alelus, reciprocal pronoun. But there is a different stress on it. There's a greater stress on it in regards to the fellowship and the corporate unity that exists, which is amazing to me. And it's almost as to say, forgive yourselves, if you will. You are so intimate, so connected together, that it can have that reflexive sense of forgive yourselves, just as God has forgiven you in Christ. So when Paul comes down the issue of forgiveness, he wants to show just how intimate and how close we are, how one we are. I encourage all the men, and it's open for the women to come, but primarily it's focusing for the men. But there's a, we will have a conference this Friday, this Saturday. Friday night from 7 to 9 is when the session will start at 7 o'clock, and then Saturday morning from 9.30 to 12. I encourage the men to come. We're going to talk about the issue of the church and the issue of leadership. And some of these things we will bring up, we've brought up in the past, to talk about what is the nature of the church? What does it look like? Somehow I think we just don't understand the issue of family, the issue of oneness, and the relationship that we have together in regards to the working of God and His Spirit in our lives. There is no doubt when you walk through 4, 1 through 16 that Paul wants us to understand the issue of oneness. And you say, okay, I understand that. And he's talking about the church, I understand that. But what bearing does that have upon home life? And well, how does that affect my life? And I'll just tell you that just as we talked about before, all of these principles need to filter into the home. They need to be worked out in the home life. They need to be worked out as husbands and wives. We need to be living these things out within the context of the home if we are to be walking a worthy walk. And I just want to just take you back to chapter 4, 1 through 16 and show you something, all right? Because we understand the focus is on unity. But here's some thoughts, though. God-designed diversity produces a God-designed unity. You know, what's interesting about chapter 4 is, and I remind you, chapter 4, verse 3, Paul ends with that. And then all of a sudden, he moves right into verse 4, one body, one spirit. There, there isn't any of this connection. He just, it just, he breaks off of this parenthetical thought, and he goes off to talk about the issue of, of this, these onenesses that are the basis of our oneness. In verses 7, he starts to talk about the issue of giftedness and the fact that there is diversity in the body. But the whole focus of 4, 1 through 16 is on unity. And so, therefore, when we look at the issue of diversity, is everything to do with the unity that God is establishing. So God has designed a diversity that is to produce a God-designed unity. Another thought. There is a God-designed diversity in His church. When we look at the issue of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers... When Paul talks about the fact that each one of us has been gifted, there is this diversity that exists in the body of Christ. But keep in mind, this is a secondary issue in chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Even when he comes to 4.17, he says, Therefore, um, therefore, this I say and affirm together, and it's in the Lord, in the sphere of the Lord. He is picking up that prepositional phrase from chapter 4, verse 1. He is going to pick up where he left off in verse 3. He had this long break. Now he's going to come back to the issue of the walk. In verse 17, he says, Therefore, this I say and affirm together in the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles walk. 
So he really broke off in verses 4 and following, and now he's going to come back 4.17 to pick up his thoughts from 4.1 through 3. In other words, that issue of diversity, the focus is unity. It's a secondary idea, is as important as it may be. It is still secondary to the overall purpose. He is focusing on the unity that must exist. These are all designed, if you will, to produce this unity, this God-ordained unity. So even when we talk about diversity in the body, it's all about unity. Notice in chapter 4, verse 13, the second time in this passage in all the New Testament, we have the word unity reference, that we all attain to the unity of the faith as a mature man, not men. So even when he talks about giftedness, the focus is still on what? It's still on unity. You got it? All right, we see this happening. What's fasting is Paul is going to get off giftedness and he's going to return back to the issue of everybody. Notice this in chapter 4, verse 16. But speaking truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. He's going to return back to this thought of unity. So here's the question. Since the discussion of gifts is secondary, what is the principle then? And this is the one of the things that, that you know, we will talk about in the conference, and always I'm always reminded, so I remind us this morning, it's always looking for the principle. What's the principle of the passage? What is it that God wants us to understand in regards to 4, 1 through 16, the issue of unity? And how does that apply to our home? How does that apply to the marriage? How does that apply to family life? Just give you some thoughts. The family is church in miniature, and as such, God builds a God-designed diversity into every marriage and family. Just think about this for a moment. As such, God builds a God-designed diversity into every marriage and family. That God-designed diversity is to produce a God-ordained unity. It's interesting because when I reflect on this, when my father was sharing, I'm just thinking back to my marriage and then the kids. It's amazing to watch the family life. And that reminds you how, how so closely related family life and church life is. And I really am learning that. I mean, it's interesting because my, my father has always said from 1 Thessalonians and other passages talking about the issue of ministry that you are to minister as though you are ministering to family. And it's interesting when 1 Thessalonians and Paul talks about his ministry to the church at Thessalonica as a father, as a mother. I mean, this is where he learned his ministry skills from mom and pop. And he brings them over into the context of the church in the context of God's household. It's been interesting for me to watch the family. God got my attention some time back. We had, Les was pregnant before we were supposed to leave to Russia. And then she had a miscarriage. And that wasn't the first one. She had another one when we were overseas. That was a little bit more scary because there wasn't any medical attention or care. We didn't know where to go or who to talk to or anything. And so we just went through it on our own, you know, and just prayed that it wasn't like the first one. The first one, I had to rush her to emergency. But God was getting my attention. And it's interesting because then Ian came along. And he truly is God's gift of grace. That's why I named him Ian. And it's interesting because watching the family grow and develop. And God is in control of all this, right? He's the one who fills the womb, empties the womb. He has control over all of that. He molds and shapes while in the womb. So as a, as a father and a husband, I'm sitting there going, God, what are you saying? And what are you trying to show me? And it's been interesting to go on this journey and to watch how God has built this family. And there were many other miscarriages that would come after that, but just to watch, and then all of a sudden, then here comes Rory and Aiden, and it's like, why all of a sudden that, and why two at the same time? And I'm thinking, God, I'm too old. 
But it's amazing to watch how he does this. I remember with Tristan because I, I had a pulmonary when I, embolism when I came off the flight from Russia. Les had to come home five weeks early. And I had to stay and finish teaching classes. So I fly into L.A. and I, and I get up to walk off the plane. And I just, all the blood just rush from my head. Everything starts spinning. And all of a sudden I go down. I come to and I'm, I'm stumbling. I don't even know how I got through customs at all. And there was a guy working there at the baggage area, and he saw me, and he came over to help me, and so he called the ambulance, and so they came, and I, I just wanted to go home. I, so they take me to the hospital, and I couldn't get out in time to see T. Bourne. I, I got there long enough, just, just after he was born, and I had a few moments with him, and I was there long enough to hold him, and then I, I just was going to pass out, and I told Les' sister to take him, and I plopped into the chair. But it was interesting because there was this lack of connection between Trist and I, but it was between he and Les. And it was interesting to go through that because it was just another way of God getting my attention. And realizing that we are this family unit and there is this interconnectedness and there is this, this bond that, that connects us, all of us together. And when there's an absence, it's felt in the body and there's changes that happen and changes that happen in relationship. Tristan was like, you know, the little baby and then all of a sudden Shay comes and they each have to find their own place. And it's amazing to watch how they just try to figure out where is my place in the family dynamic? Where is my role? What is it supposed to look like to just sit and watch of all of them figure out who am I and where do I fit in all of this? And where do I fit in the family and how do I make it happen? And they're all so different and so unique and they have all of their unique personalities and abilities and traits and everything. And they come together and it's what makes us a family and it makes us whole and it makes us one. It's the body of Christ. When people come into this body and God continues to build up his family, when people come, we look and we say, here's another family member. How has God gifted them? What is their role in this family? How is it supposed to look? How is it going to work? It's how we should be looking at each other. We're family. We each have a role. And to just sit and say, you know what, here comes so-and-so, and how is God blessing this family? How does he want it to look, and how does he want it to function? What is the ministry that he wants to take place? And everyone is going to be different, but it's all about building up this unity that God has established. You take it into the home, you take it into the church, and I, and I think about this fact in relation to the home life, and... and thought my father planted in, in, in the minds is this. In our marriages, we often violate God's design that we allow our God-designed differences to divide rather than to enhance our marriages. We do this in the church as well. We do it in our own households. We do it in God's household. We don't allow for the diversity. We don't allow for the differences. It's amazing when I look at my relationship with Les because we are just so totally opposite. It's funny because we went, we went to one counseling session before I had my accident. Went to counseling session. Ken Unruh. Hey, this is his advice to us after our first session. He came later and says, you two should not get married. You don't belong together. You are so opposite. You will never make it. I had my action. We went through all of these different things together in the church and everything like that. Kid came and said later, says, you guys need to get married. You belong together. We're so totally different. But that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. And we have to realize that all of us are going to be different. And even when we look at other people's marriages, I mean, oftentimes we do that. We look at so-and-so's marriage, and I want to be like them. You're nothing like them. I was thinking about my sisters, you know, I love them dearly. But some of the decisions they make, I just go, I wouldn't do that. And sometimes they irritate me by things that they do. But my sisters, I love them. But you know, the thing that's amazing is as different as they are and their households are, 
there's a common element to all of our houses, and that is the fact that we all desire to raise godly children and have godly households. We base off the same principles, but things look different, and it's okay to have that diversity. The problem is sometimes we look at someone else's marriage and we go, I want to have exactly that, but you're not exactly that. Embrace how God has designed you to be. Embrace the differences because that's what produces the unity. It takes the uniqueness to bring about the unification. I mean, you look at spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians. If everyone was an eye, if everyone was a hand, if everyone was a foot, right? It's not how God designed it to be. These principles have everything to do, not just with the church, but with our family life, right? It's a household of households. And, and I wish that, you know, talking to men in ministry and men who, who will be leaders in the future is just to keep in mind that we are a household, a family, and it needs to run like that. It's not an organization. It's not a business. We don't have to sit and vote on everything that happens in the body of Christ. People come into the body and they brought brought into the body by God. He has gifted them. He has designed them for a particular role. We release them, get out of the way, let them find their place, let them do their thing. If they don't violate the word of God, then don't say a word and let them do. We just get in God's way. Let Him define. Let Him define the home. Let Him define the church. I give you another thought. Walk in love. We're not going to go through all of these. <clears throat> Chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Walk in love. There's no doubt that this is what is called for there. The command that is given. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us and offering a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. I, I love this. Just was thinking about this, and I thank my brother because he helped put some of my thoughts into pedestrian terminology, so we have it down for you. But two things that Paul brings out in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, he talks about the issue of love. You are God's child, and not only that, you are God's beloved child. Just think about that. You are God's child, and you are God's beloved child. And again, the household, the family, we are God's children, all of us are. And so therefore we need to function like a family. To me what's interesting, and we didn't talk about this, we went through this passage, because you can't cover everything that, that comes in these passages. Just a thought for you, the, t the term child that Paul uses here, he doesn't use weos, he uses tekna. You know what's interesting about this particular term, that in the classical period, this term was used of an only child to whom parents devoted all of their love and attention. Just think about that. Just think about that. I put it this way. We have all been loved with a singularity of love. My brother said we need to refine a little bit and make it a little bit easier for everyone to understand, so here we go. We have all been loved as though we were the only ones to be loved. Do you hear that? I mean, that's just, to me, is such an amazing statement that we are His beloved child. We have all been loved by God with such a singularity of love. We have been loved as though we were the only ones to love. Not only that, but then he gives us the example of Christ, just as Christ loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering, a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. We have received so much from God. Not just this, but when he starts in 5.1, Therefore, be imitators of God. He's building off of the previous verse. Just as God in Christ has forgiven you, we are to forgive each other. We need to have a forgiving love. We need to have a forgiving love. As family, as children of God, as recipients of forgiveness and love, we need to be marked by these things. I'll just say, we will not move forward very far as family if we cannot have a forgiving love for one another. We're going to offend each other. We really are. 
We're going to get on each other's nerves. We may have our arguments time and again. But we need to have a forgiving love or we cannot move forward. You know, I was thinking about this because this thought always comes to my mind about carrying on baggage. I was thinking about that movie, The Mission, with Robert De Niro. And he's doing penance and he's carrying this big canvas full of all of these worldly possessions and everything and he's doing penance and he's dragging this thing carrying it on his back and he's heading off to this village off into the jungle and this is how he's going to pay for his sins if you will and it was interesting because I just this image always comes to my mind when I think about the issue of not forgiving people and we just carry along this baggage of things we shouldn't be carrying along sometimes we do that in the church and we do that definitely in our marriages and family life is that we have all of this baggage of past offenses and things that have happened to us and we just keep dragging it with us and dragging with us we can't move forward unless we let it go We have to be willing to let it go if we want to go forward. Paul says in Philippians 3, right, forgetting what lies behind, right, so that I can press on towards the goal that I can strive with all of my effort and energy towards that price to which I have been called. You cannot get there if you keep looking back and if you can't let go. We won't get very far in our relationships if we cannot have a forgiving love for one another. It's interesting because he gives this example, both of them, in reference to God and his work. But notice verse 32, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. He doesn't say in yourself, he says in Christ. There is no way that I can forgive anybody in myself, but in Christ and who he is and what he has accomplished, absolutely I can. And absolutely I should. It's interesting because when I was thinking about this, just jump with me to the, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 18 God, this last week, brought this to my mind, this parable, and I take you there. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and following. And, and I'm thankful to the Lord because I need to be reminded of this. So this is, this is for me, not, not for you, but I just take you there anyway. Matthew 18, verses 21 and following. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Peter's being generous here because according to rabbinic teaching, it was three times. That was it. So Peter's being generous in this question he asks. Verse 22, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, do you really honestly think that Jesus wants to count every, uh, us to count every time we've forgiven somebody, right? Well, once I get up to 400 or whatever, then I'm, I'm done. That's not the point, right? But let's go on. Verse 23 and following. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, some suggested that 10,000 talents would equal in our day millions of dollars. i just throw that out for you. Verse 25, But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children, all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell on the ground, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, which someone suggested a few dollars. And he seized him and he began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and he went and threw him in prison until he should repay him back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Verse 32, then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And as his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. Verse 35, 
my heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. I take you back to Ephesians 4, but you know, if we have experienced the forgiveness of God, how can we not forgive somebody else? If we have experienced the love of God, that sacrificial love, how can we not love our family? So often we partake of all of these blessings from God, and yet when one is asked upon from us to manifest these things to them, we hold back and we say, I can't, or I refuse to. We have been forgiven such a great debt, I don't think we will ever comprehend how great that debt is. The reality of it is there is nothing we cannot forgive. If God has forgiven all that He has forgiven, there is nothing we cannot forgive, and there is no reason we should not love as Christ loved us. Somehow, we have to take these things and bring them down to our everyday life. These principles just aren't for the family of God. They're for us. Unity should be manifested in the household of God. It should be manifested in our household. Love should be manifested in the household of God. It needs to be manifested in our household. And both of these themes, if you look at the passage of husbands and wives, we have both of these stressed. We have the issue of unity. We have the issue of love. But all of them have relevance to us, every single one of them. And it all begins here. We are the husband of the wife. We are the father of the children. We are the master of the slave. But the linchpin to this whole section is the relationship of husband and wife. If somehow we together as husband and wives are not walking the way that we ought to walk, then we can't expect the family to be what it's supposed to be. And we can't expect the same for God's household if we're not walking the way that we are to be walking. All of these things have to filter down into our life. Unity, non-worldliness, love, light, care, and caution. What's the principle if we look at all of this? Uh, and just, just some thoughts. And I give you this, like I say, we're going to go through all of them. Just give you two as an example. I challenge you to go back through chapters 4 and following and meditate on them for yourself. But what is the principle that we have from here? <clears throat> if we look at all of these together, these are several thoughts that, that my father has given and I just pass on to you. We often have failed to allow for God-designed differences to enhance our marriages and thus produce a God-ordained unity. When it comes to walking in non-worldliness, we very often allow the world to establish the template for our marriages such as sexual orientations and divorce. We allow the world to define what husband and wife and family life ought to be like. It's not the world that defines it. It is God who has defined it from the very beginning. It is the first institution He laid down. And it is crucial to all human interaction from that point on. It is the basis of society. It is the basis of humanity. We can't even talk about human being without the establishment of marriage and the relationship between a husband and a wife. There is no human species without that. If there is no husband and wife, there is no procreation. There is no human species. There is no propagation. There is nothing. It's the basis for so much that we see in the world. It's the basis for the church life because we're family. So often we allow the world to define rather than allowing God to define how He wants it to be. When it comes to the issue of love, we fail to exhibit a selfless, Christ-like, forgiving love. We just do. We're willing to receive from God, but we're not willing to manifest what we have received. That's why I like the song, Channels Only. And I'll be honest, the first time I, I, I sang that song, I didn't really realize the impact, but later I just understood, Channels Only, we're just conduits. We're conduits through which God works. 
problem is sometimes we stop up so we can't be that conduit. And we say, no, God, I'm not going to let you work through me. And no, this isn't going to be manifested through my life. We often fail to exhibit habits of light, such as goodness, righteousness, and truth, but instead deeds of darkness. And we often, not as cautious we ought to be in our life in letting the Spirit guide us in submission and in resisting the devil and his ways. We need to have Spirit-driven churches. We need to have Spirit-driven homes. It's the issue of yieldedness. And I think it's harder for us, for men, to accept this fact is to allow the Lord to lead, to allow the Spirit to lead, because we're men, we want to be that which is in control. It's interesting because I take you back to this passage, 522 and following. Yes, the husband is head of the household, but look at the focus on Christ throughout that passage. Over and over, it's Christ, Lord, Lord, Master in heaven. <clears throat> somehow, I pray we understand these things. Somehow, I pray that we can take these truths and start to manifest them in our homes. Somehow, I pray that we would embrace the idea that we are a God-designed family and that we need to be godly-driven household, not only as a church, but in our individual homes. Such amazing truth, such amazing blessings that we have received, but somehow they need to have the practical outworking in our everyday life. And the best place to start is in our home. And the amazing thing is that, you know, I remind you of this fact, chapter 3. We can look at our households and say, you know what? Ours is a mess. Look, we're all a mess. <laughs> we're all a mess. There's not one perfect marriage in here at all. There just isn't. If there was, we wouldn't be here. We would be in glory already. There's no perfection this side of glory. That doesn't mean we don't keep striving towards that. But we have to remember this one fact in chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. When we look at the relationships in the home and say, God, I can't say I need you to enable me to do this the power is there the spirit is there Christ who is the sovereign Lord is there all we have to do is avail ourselves of that and our homes can be all that God wants them to be and all that he has designed them to be all we have to do is yield it's yield submit to the one master that's all we have to do May God help us, and may we find ourselves on our knees yielding to the one who is in control and availing ourselves of that power that is there. Let's pray.